Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the use of bronchodilators uh, in the treatment of um, asthma. Okay, so we're currently looking at the pathology of asthma. So what we've seen is that um, so far we've had this type 1 hypersensitivity reaction where when the uh, person was initially exposed to the allergen, they initiated a humoral adaptive immune response. And let me stress that that is the point at which this goes wrong. You should not initiate a humoral adaptive immune response against this allergen, basically. This is an innocuous protein. It shouldn't have this initiated against it, which is why it's called a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, because the immune system is launching an immune response against something that really is not worthy of an immune response. It should not stimulate an immune response. Okay, so it's too sensitive. Uh, so you produce this IgE that is ma uh, targeted against the allergen. Okay, and these IgE molecules are going to be mounted on the surface of mast cells uh, via binding to this FC epsilon R1 receptor. Okay, now, what's going to happen next is that you're going to get secondary exposure to the allergen. Okay, so you're going to inhale uh, the allergen into your airways. Okay, now some of this allergen will make it through to the lamina propria uh, in the walls of the um, airways, okay? And here it will meet these mast cells which are within the lamina propria. Now, the allergen can then bind to the uh, antigen binding portion of these IgE uh, molecules on the surface of the um, um, mast cells, and this will activate the FC epsilon R1 receptor and then activate the mast cells. Okay, so you're going to get mast cells. Um, sorry, this is it should be secondary exposure to the allergen, not secondary allergen. Okay, secondary exposure to allergen. Okay, so you're going to get mast cell activation. Now, what do mast cells do uh, when they uh, become active? Okay, well, let's talk about this. Um, mast cells basically uh, have a huge number of granules within them. So let me show some of these. So they have vesicles within their cytoplasm, which are uh, filled with histamine. Okay, so let me put this in turquoise. So these vesicles have a lot of histamine within them. So these turquoise dots, these represent histamine molecules. Okay, stored in these mast cell granules. So these will be called histamine granules that are within the cytoplasm of the mast cell. Okay, now, uh, what's going to happen for one wet thing when you activate these mast cells is you're going to get the release of these histamine granules. Okay, but you're also going to get more than that. So let's have a discussion of this. So, mast cell activation, what it results in is it results in... Um, the um, increase in calcium in the cytoplasm of the mast cells. So calcium is going to go up within the cytoplasm of the mast cells. Now one thing this leads to is it leads to the exocytosis of these histamine uh, granules and that's known as degranulation. Okay, So when you release the granules from the mast cells it's called mast cell degranulation. Okay, so that's going to release a huge amount of histamine into uh, the extracellular fluid. Okay, so one of the key mediators that these mast cells are going to release is histamine. So you remember when I told you about how mast cells are basically cells that are always on the lookout. They're these sentinel cells that are on the lookout for any sort of disturbance. And when they find the disturbance, they're going to release all sorts of alarm signals. Well, one of these alarm signals is histamine. Okay, but that's not the only alarm signal they're going to send. Um, another alarm signal, well, many other alarm signals are going to be released. So, how do we uh, produce these other alarm signals? Well, basically, calcium is going to activate an enzyme within the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, so let me have a show this enzyme. So, I'll put it um, here. Okay, so this enzyme is known as cellular phospho lipase A2, okay, or CPLA2 for short. So the full name for this is cellular um, phospholipase A2, okay, and basically cellular phospholipase A2 has um, calcium, uh, well, has a calcium binding domain, has a special domain uh, that can bind calcium 
And this domain is used in all sorts of proteins, and it's known as a C2 domain. Okay, so what's going to happen is that calcium is going to, well, calcium ions are going to bind to this C2 domain within the cellular phospholipase A2, and multiple calcium ions can bind to that C2 domain. And what it's going to cause is it's going to cause the translocation of the enzyme. So the enzyme usually remains within the cytoplasm of the cell. However, now what's going to happen once it's got calcium bound to the C2 domain is the enzyme can translocate to uh, the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so usually it's within the cytoplasm, but now it's going to translocate up to the phospholipid bilayer. And once it gets to the phospholipid bilayer, it's going to start uh, breaking down a component of the phospholipid bilayer known as phosphatidylcholine. So let me talk about phosphatidylcholine then. So I'll try and squeeze this in down here. So phosphatidylcholine. Okay, so phosphatidylcholine is a type of phospholipid. It's a modified phospholipid. Okay, so let me show you the structure of a boring old normal phospholipid. And then let me show you how you can modify it to turn it into a phosphatidylcholine molecule. Okay, so a normal old boring old phospholipid looks like this, okay, in cartoon form at least. Okay, so you have these two uh, long chain carboxylic acids which are stirified to the first and second alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule. Okay, and the glycerol molecule is this horizontal line which I've now um, coloured in green. So let me label some of these components up. So glycerol is the main backbone for a phospholipid. Okay, and its proper name, its chemist's name, is to call it propane 1, 2, 3, trial. And although propane 1, 2, 3, trial is a bit of a mouthful, it does at least tell you exactly what this molecule is. It's a free carbon molecule where you have alcohol groups coming off all three of the carbons. Okay. Now, you have then a stirified to the first and the second alcohol groups, you have a stirified long chain carboxylic acids. And the old biochemist's name for a long chain carboxylic acid is to call it a fatty acid. Okay, now these are just carboxylic acids where the tail is really, really long, basically. So you've stirified two of these very long chain carboxylic acids to uh, the first and second alcohol groups of glycerol. And then to the third alcohol group, you have a stirified a phosphate group, okay, via a phosphoester link. Okay, so this is a phosphate group, and that's the phospholipid within uh, the name, okay. Well, it's the phospho within the phospholipid. Okay, so there is our um, glycerol um, molecule with its phosphate group bound in the position 3. Okay, so this entire structure is known as a phospholipid, but the old name for a phospholipid was a phosphatidate molecule. Okay, and although no one would ever describe, what, well, no one would ever call a phospholipid a phosphatidate molecule now, when we're talking about modified phospholipids, for some reason everyone always uses phosphatidate. This is what this phosphatidyl here means. It means a normal phospholipid molecule. And then what have we done to this normal phospholipid molecule? Well, we stuck on choline, basically. So phosphatidylcholine basically means one of these with a choline molecule stuck onto it. Now, a choline molecule is another uh, alcohol molecule. So let me just show you the structure of a choline molecule. So here's the alcohol group. And by the way, this choline is the same choline that's within acetylcholine. Okay, in that case, you uh, add on an acetyl group onto this alcohol group via a normal ester link. Uh, but here is the normal choline. So we've got an alcohol group on two carbons, so nothing um, complicated yet. And then we've got a nitrogen here, and off this nitrogen we've got three methyl groups. Okay, so this nitrogen has one too many bonds. So in one of these bonds, the nitrogen has donated both electrons into the bond, and that means that the nitrogen overall has given away one electron, because when you donate both electrons into a bond, 
Okay, so that sets this bond. The nitrogen provides both electrons. Now, the normal understanding of a covalent bond is that one electron was provided by each species. So, if you provide both electrons in, then effectively, you've given one of the electrons to the carbon, because the understanding now is that one of these electrons belongs to the carbon, and one belongs to the nitrogen. So, by providing both electrons, you've actually effectively given away one. So, the nitrogen has a positive charge. Of course, that meant that when the carbon came along initially, it must have had a positive charge as well, because I haven't put a negative charge on there, so it must have originally had a positive charge, and because it's nicked an electron off the nitrogen, it's transferred that positive charge onto the nitrogen. Okay, so this is the choline alcohol molecule, which is positively charged. Now, uh, as I say, in acetylcholine, you'd um, bind an acetic acid molecule onto this alcohol group via a normal ester link. Uh, to make phosphatidylcholine, what we're going to do is we're going to bind this alcohol group to the phosphate group. There's another free alcohol group on this phosphate group. So phosphate groups have two alcohol groups. One of them has been involved in binding to the alcohol group on the um, glycerol molecule, but the other one is now going to be involved in forming a phosphoester link uh, with this alcohol group on the choline. So effectively, we're going to stick this choline molecule on here, and I'll just show it as a blue rectangle here as far as our cartoon is concerned. So, here is the structure of phosphatidylcholine in cartoon form here. So, what is cellular phospholipase A2 going to do to phosphatidylcholine? And by the way, phosphatidylcholine is often abbreviated as PC. And I hope what I've convinced you of is that it's just a norm, well, it's just a modified phospholipid. It's just a phospholipid with a bigger head that sticks into the cytoplasm or the extracellular fluid. But this is a normal component of the phospholipid bilayer. You don't just have the boring old normal phospholipids. You have some of these uh, different ones, these modified ones, to make you know the phospholipid bilayer more interesting. Okay, so, uh, when you bring this cellular phospholipase A2 enzyme up to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, it's going to start working on these uh, phosphatidylcholine molecules. Now, specifically, it's going to cleave the ester link between this second long-chain carboxylic acid group and the second alcohol group of the glycerol molecule, and that will yield two products. Okay, so where can I draw these? So, one of them I'll put here. Okay, and they're both going to still remain within the phospholipid by there. It's just I can't show this because the, I've drawn all over it. Okay, so I'll put another phospholipid by there here. So it's still within the phospholipid by there. And you have cut off that second long chain carboxylic acid. And here it now is the free uh, long chain carboxylic acid. So here in orange is the long chain carboxylic acid that was cut off. Here is the one that still is remained bound to the glycerol. Here is the glycerol molecule, again in green. Here is the phosphate group in pink. And here is our choline uh, alcohol group that's, uh, well, our choline molecule that's stuck off the um, phosphate group down there. Okay, so, what are these two products called? Well, the bigger of the two, this one here, what's left over after you've cut off a single long-chain carboxylic acid, is what's known as a lysophosphatidylcholine molecule. Okay, so this is lysophosphatidylcholine. Okay, and the long-chain carboxylic acid that you produce, this one over here, which long-chain carboxylic acid is that? Well, the normal long-chain carboxylic acid that is esterified in the second position of phosphatidylcholine is a, a long-chain carboxylic acid called arachidonic acid, okay? Or often abbreviated to AA for short. So, we are producing these two products within our membrane of our mast cell. We're producing arachidonic acid and lysophosphatidylcholine. Now, we're going to use the arachidonic acid to make certain uh, products, basically, okay, that are going to be released from the mast cell. So, let's go on with this. So, let me get another piece of paper here. Right, okay, so, we now have arachidonic acid, then, AA here. Okay, now, 
what can happen is this arachidonic acid can either uh, be acted upon by cyclooxygenase enzymes, which will convert it into prostaglandin H2, and then it can be uh, converted into prostanoids, or it can go down the 5-lipoxygenase route, okay? And in these mast cells, in asthma, it's more important to look at the 5-lipoxygenase uh, route than to look at the um, uh, cyclooxygenase pathway, okay? So more important in asthma is uh, the fact that the arachidonic acid is going to be converted into, well, eventually, leukotrienes, basically, rather than prostanoids. So it will, you will get the release of prostanoids from the mast cells, but more important is the release of leukotrienes. So we will study the release of the leukotrienes. Okay, so um, arachidonic acid then is going to be acted upon by an enzyme known as 5-lipoxygenase. And this again is normally an enzyme which is within the um, cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, and it's often abbreviated to 5-LOX, okay, which stands for 5-lipoxygenase. So it's usually within the cytoplasm of the cell, but again, uh, when, you, um, when you get calcium going up in the cytoplasm of the cell, it causes the activation of the 5-lipoxygenase, and it translocates it to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. And when it gets to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bile there, then it will be in contact with the arachidonic acid that the cellular phospholipase A2 has released from the phosphatidylcholine. And what it's going to catalyze is the conversion of arachidonic acid, firstly into 5-HPETE, okay, okay, which stands for 5 hydroperoxy uh, icosa tetraenoic acid. So let me put this down. So this stands for 5 hydroperoxy um, and then um, icosa tetraenoic acid is ETE. Icosa tetraenoic acid. Okay. So uh, E is for icosa, TE is then for tetraenoic acid. Okay, so 5-hydroperoxy icosa tetraenoic acid is 5-HPTE, okay? And then 5-HPTE is going to um, be then converted again by 5-lipoxygenase into uh, what's known as leukotriene A4, okay? LTA4. So both of these conversions, the conversion of arachidonic into 5-hydroperoxy uh, icosatetraenoic acid, and then the conversion of 5-hydroperoxy icosatetraenoic acid into leukotriene A4, are conducted by this enzyme 5-lipoxygenase. Okay? And then what's going to happen is this leukotriene A4 can then be uh, taken two ways. It can go two ways. It can either be converted into leukotriene B4, okay, or it can be converted into uh, leukotriene C4. So, one way is that it's going to be converted into leukotriene B4, the other way is that it's going to be converted into leukotriene C4. Now, the enzyme that converts leukotriene A4 into leukotriene B4 is a cytoplasmic enzyme which is called leukotriene A4 hydrolase. Okay, and I suppose I should have probably written out the name leukotriene at least once. I'll write it out at least once. So leukotriene A4, okay, which is often abbreviated to LT. So usually we abbreviate leukotriene to LT and then just put the number afterwards. So again, these are leukotriene B4 and leukotriene C4. Okay, and uh, if you want to convert leukotriene A4 into leukotriene C4, the enzyme which does that is an enzyme which is often abbreviated to GST, which stands for glutathione S transferase. And I'll write this over here because I'm running out of space over there. Glutathione S transferase. Okay, so the S, sorry, the G is for glutathione. The S is for S, and the T is for transferase. Okay, so GST. So, both of these enzymes are in the cytoplasm, and leukotriene A4 basically comes, once you've 
Okay, start again. Once you've converted arachidonic acid into leukotriene A4, leukotriene A4 then comes out of the membrane and into the cytoplasm so that it can be acted upon by these uh, enzymes, leukotriene A4 hydrolase and glutathione S transferase. Okay, so then what can happen is leukotriene C4 can be converted further into leukotriene D4 and then onwards into leukotriene E4. Okay, and now what's going to happen is all four of these products are going to be secreted from the cell. And that's important to understand that it's not just leukotriene B4 and leukotriene E4 that are secreted. All four of them, these intermediates on the way to leukotriene E4, they are also secreted. So they're going to be secreted from uh, the mast cell. Okay, now another important thing to note is that these three here, okay, they all pretty much do exactly the same thing and they are often given a joint name, so they are often uh, together all referred to as the cystinyl leukotrienes, okay, um, and they will often be abbreviated as cis. LT for cystinyl leukotrienes. So they all effectively do exactly the same thing. So rather than saying leukotriene C4, D4, and E4 will do this, we instead say the cystinyl leukotrienes will do this. Whereas leukotriene B4 is not a cystinyl leukotriene. So overall, we would say that the mast cells are going to secrete leukotriene B4 as well as the cystinyl leukotriene. So they're going to secrete uh, two types of product, the cystinyl leukotrienes and the leukotriene B4. Okay, and these two products are then going to go on uh, and cause much of the uh, pathology associated with asthma. Okay, so so far we've seen that the mast cells are going to degranulate and release histamine. They're also going to set up these production line for uh, leukotriene B4 and the cystinyl leukotrienes. Now they're also going to secrete one last um, alarm call basically that we're going to focus on, okay, which is tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. So overall we now have our four uh, products basically. We have histamine, leukotriene B4, the cystinyl leukotrienes, and TNF alpha, which stands for tumor necrosis factor alpha. Okay, now often you will hear people refer to tumor necrosis factor alpha just as tumor necrosis factor. Now this is because uh, it's the most important tumor necrosis factor. There are other tumor necrosis factors. There's tumor necrosis factor beta, there's tumor necrosis factor C, just to name a few examples. But the most important tumor necrosis factor by far is tumor necrosis factor alpha. So if people refer to tumor necrosis factor or TNF without clarifying which one they mean, you can assume they mean tumor necrosis factor alpha. Okay, now we'll see what these four um, products of the mast cells are going to do and how that's going to lead to asthma in the next video.